This is a little bit of a difficult passage to, to read and it's quite long. The, the canto is called The Gospel of Death and the Vanity of the Ideal. Savitri has experienced the dream twilight of the ideal, which was a very, very beautiful um, realm, but everything fleeting, moving, you can't hold on to it. And now death is telling her that all your ideals, they are like this. They're like beautiful uh, imaginary butterflies. You can never hold on to them. Hmm? So he has been saying like that about um, love, that uh, this is an illusion, that truth is an illusion, or if something like eternal truth is there, it can never be on earth. It will always be far away. Hmm? So now he's going to speak about the avatars, the great beings, divine beings who have incarnated on the earth to help humanity. He says, death says, the avatars have lived and died in vain. Vain was the sage's thought, the prophet's voice. In vain is seen the shining upward way. Earth lies unchanged beneath the circling sun. She loves her fall and no omnipotence her mortal imperfections can erase. Force on man's crooked ignorance heaven's straight line or colonize a world of death with gods. O oh, traveler in the chariot of the sun, high priestess in thy holy fancy's shrine, who with a magic ritual in earth's house worshipest ideal and eternal love. What is this love thy thought has deified? This sacred legend and immortal myth. It is a conscious yearning of thy flesh. It is a glorious burning of thy nerves. A rose of dream splendor petaling thy mind, a great red rapture and torture of thy heart, a sudden transfiguration of thy days, it passes and the world is as before. A ravishing edge of sweetness and of pain a thrill in its yearning makes it seem divine, a golden bridge across the roar of the years, a cord tying thee to eternity. And yet, how brief and frail, how soon is spent this treasure wasted by the gods on man, this happy closeness as of soul to soul, this honey of the body's companionship, this heightened joy, this ecstasy in the veins, this strange illumination of the sense. If Satyavan had lived, love would have died. 
but Satyavan is dead, and love shall live a little while in thy sad breast, until his face and body fade on memory's wall, where other bodies, other faces come. I will pause there. Who's going to read first? The avatars have lived and died. Vain was the sage's thought, the prophet's voice. In vain you see the shining of your day. Hmm. Thank you. It's very interesting that what we read on Wednesdays in the Life Divine, how it gets echoed on Thursdays in the Savitri class. Um, yesterday we were reading about the prophet and the sage and the liberated man, and then Sri Aurobindo uh, started to say, but what has been the effect on earth? It doesn't seem to have been very much, and why is that? No? So that is what death is saying here, that the avatars have lived and died in vain. I don't think Sri Aurobindo would agree to that, but it's this idea that all this spiritual effort, what is it worth? What does it achieve? Next to nothing. Hmm. So the wise men, the sages, the thought of the wise men, the sages thought, it's all useless. The prophets come and warn you and give guidance. No effect. Even you may see this shining upward way. It may be revealed to you. But uh, you can't follow it. Jana. Was unchanged beneath the circling sun. She lost her hope with no home for them. Her auto imperfections, imperfections can arise. Force of men's proof, ignorance, heaven's straight line. For her life, the world of death is birth. Yes. So all these avatars have come and gone. The sages have thought carefully, seen higher possibilities. The prophets have come to tell you the way. But earth is still the chain, unchanged. Earth lies unchanged. The sun goes round and round. Earth, he says, loves her fall. She She's in love with this fallen state that she is in. And no omnipotence. There's no all power which can wipe out, erase. It's what you do with an eraser. You, know, you rub out something. No, there's no power that can wipe out the mortal imperfections of the earth. By that he means the earth life, the, all these uh, so many, many imperfections we experience here. There's no all power that can force human beings to follow heaven's straight line. Human beings are entrenched in their crooked ignorance. This is a, a Vedic idea that there's a straight way to the truth but that humanity is following this crooked line. Mm. It can't go straight. Mm. And he says there's no power that can, can colonize that world of death. Earth is a world of death. It's ruled by death. All beings on earth are mortal, they are subject to death. 
So it's impossible to colonize earth with immortal beings, with gods. That can't happen. To colonize, it means um, the idea is an old Greek idea, an old Greek custom in the city states of ancient Greece. Um, when the population reached a certain number, or in some places it was ritually done every seven years, they would choose all the best young men and young women and give them a ship and uh, supplies and send them off to find a new place where they would settle down and uh, build their own city and develop their civilized, Greek civilized life colonizing. Of course, in modern times, it's been the, the powerful nations have colonized the not so powerful nations. And when, how much they have civilized them is a, a debatable matter. No, in fact, they've just exploited them. But here he's talking about the original idea of going to a, a place, an uninhabited place, and setting up a uh, uh, a, a good culture and uh, settlement there. No? So the idea is that perhaps gods from higher planes could come and settle here on earth, colonize and improve the earth life. But he says that's impossible. There's no power that can do that. Um, Suresh. War traveler in the area of the sun. I prejudice in the holy fancy shrine who with a magic ritual in earth's house worshippers ideal and eternal love. What is the what is this love thy thought has defied? Deified. Deified this sacred vision and mortal mind. In myth, yes. Myth. Yeah. So when he says, oh, traveler in the chariot of the sun, he's addressing Savitri. Mm. Uh, this has something to do with her name. Mm. That Savitri is a, a name for the sun. So as if she's riding in the chariot of the sun, she's traveling with the light. He, sa he says that she's a high priestess, a leading priestess. We have high priests, no? He says you are a high priestess. Uh, you are the high priestess in the shrine, in the sacred place of your fancy, your imagination. It's maybe a holy fancy. That's where you are worshipping. You are using a magic ritual here in the material world, in earth's house, and you are worshipping ideal and eternal love, which actually doesn't have any place on earth. No? And then he challenges her. He says, what is this love? You have deified, you have turned this idea of love into a god. It's in fact, it's just a sacred legend. A legend is something, when we use this word, we mean that the story that is told can't be true. It's a story that's been passed down but it can't be true. It doesn't have any basis. And similarly, an immortal myth. You think that love is immortal, but in fact love is just a myth. Of course, I don't want to say that myths are useless fiction, but that's what he means. No? Actually, myths are very powerful, symbolic ways 
of communicating truths. But in the common speech, when we say, oh, it's just a myth, we mean it's not true. There's no basis in fact. Hmm. So what is this? And he's just going to tell us what he thinks love is. That's next. Verbal. It is a conscious yearning of the flesh. It is the glorious yearning of thy nerves, the rose of dream, splendor, heavening thy mind, the great red rapture and the heart of thy heart. So if you remember what it's like to f- fall in love, there's something in this. You know, a conscious yearning of the flesh. The whole body wakes up with thrill. You know? It's a glorious burning of the nerves. In the mind, it blossoms like a rose. But a rose that's more splendid than any physical rose. It's a rose of dream splendor. You know? It's an intense delight, a great red rapture, a deep red rose. No? And at the same time, it can be painful. It can be so intense that it's painful, that it's a torture of the heart. No? The sudden transformation of the days. It places and the world is as before. And yes, you can come. It of sweetness and of faith. The thrill is its yearning melts its thing divine. The golden bridge across the road of the earth. The God tying sea to eternity. Yes. So this word transfiguration. It's like transformation. It means changing everything. But it's in a more magical way. In the fairy stories, um, the prince gets transfigured into a frog. And then somebody has to kiss him before he can be transfigured back to his own shape. So we use the word transformation, especially in the context of Sri and the mother in another way, transfiguration. So, but love does that. It transfigures your days. Uh, They seem more glorious, more divine. But after some time, the love fades away, it passes, and the world is just as it was before. That magic light has faded. While it lasts, he says, a ravishing edge of sweetness and of pain. It's an image like the the blade of a knife. But on one side there's sweetness, and on the other side there's pain. And they come together on this edge And the pain makes the sweetness more intense. Or the sweetness uh, somehow alleviates the pain. This is ravishing. It's uh, so delightful. So another characteristic of love is yearning. It wants to be satisfied. It wants to feel fulfilled and... um, achieved no? but in that yearning there's a thrill there's an excitement uh, something delightful that makes it seem divine this state and even you may think that it is like a golden bridge across the roar of the years that love will last through all the difficult times that it will go on, it will be like a golden bridge carrying you through time. Mm? You may even think that it's something that connects you 
to eternity beyond the earth. Hmm? It is all these things, or it feels like when you're experiencing it, this is what it feels like. The roar, a loud noise, yes, as if the, there's lots of noise. Um, you could think of time as a river, yes, which is uh, rushing and making a roar, and there's a bridge across, a golden bridge. Hmm? Yes, now please, uh, Martin, go ahead. And yet, how brief and frail, how soon is spent his treasure, wasted by the gods on man. This happy closeness is of soul to soul, this honey of the body's companionship, this heightened joy, this ecstasy in the veins, this strange illumination of the sense. Mm. So you may feel that it's a bridge across the years. You may feel even that it connects you to timelessness, to eternity. And yet, in fact, how brief, how short-lived, and how frail, how weak, fragile is human love. And how soon it is spent, as if you have a certain amount of love, and you spend it, it's all gone in no time. You know? He says, this treasure, <coughs> which is wasted by the gods on man. Gods, the gods send you this treasure of love, but how you waste it. And then he again goes to this uh, description that we can recognize, this happy closeness as of soul to soul. This honey, this sweetness of the body's companionship and the way that joy gets heightened by being close to a loved one, increased. And even it's running in the body, this ecstasy in the veins. And even what happens is the senses, all the senses and the nerves get sensitized when we are in love so that we experience everything more intensely. This strange illumination of thy senses as if everything's lit up. But he's saying how brief and how frail all this is. It's a momentary experience. Ganga Lakshmi. Yes. <coughs> if such a man had lived, love would have died. But such a man would die that love shall live. A little while in the suburb and see his face and burn far from the world. There was a burn Yes. So he's quite uh, clear about this, that it, love doesn't last long. If Satyavan had not died, the love would have died. Hmm? But because Satyavan is dead, your love for him will la live on for some time, for a little while. Hmm? In your sad breast, you will mourn him, you will feel him, you will miss him. But after some time, it will be like a picture on a wall. Uh, it will fade away, his face and body will fade on the wall of your memory. And other, you will remember other bodies and other faces. They will come and occupy that place. It is true. It is, that's the thing life is going on. Yeah, so this is quite a, uh, a cynical description, but we can recognize it, accurate description of human love. And I'm afraid we have to wait quite a long time 
until we come to Savitri's answer. And she gives a, a completely different picture of the significance of love. But this, one, this is one that we can recognize. And that's what I was saying last week, that it seems that the reason Sri Aurobindo goes into such detail into these arguments of death is because they correspond to voices or feelings or thoughts or experiences that we have. That's, uh, that's how we experience things. And it is Savitri's task to take us beyond this disillusionment to perceive some, a higher truth. Or, but uh, we have to be patient before we come to here. Yes. The divine love should govern the world. We we have Martin here. He has made a very nice compilation about divine love. A nice little book. Yes, you know it. Yes. So he's going to continue this description. Do you like to read? Sitting at the back there, would you like to read? One sentence, yes? When love breaks suddenly into the life, at first man steps into a world of the sun. In this passion he feels his heavenly element but only a fine sunlit patch of earth. The marvelous aspect took off heaven's outburst. The snake is there and the worm in the heart of the rose. Yes. So, when suddenly we fall in love, it's as if everything has lighted up and in this intense feeling we feel that, oh, this is my divine part. This is how it feels. Mm. But death says that it's only what has happened is that one fine sunlit patch of earth has taken on this appearance, this marvelous aspect of an outburst of heaven. In fact, these powers of earth are still there. The snake is there, hiding under the rose bush. And even the rose itself, which is some, often a symbol of love. No? There's a worm, a caterpillar there, eating away at it, spoiling it. Yes, you will read? Sorry, I didn't bring my reading glass. <laughs> okay, John? A word, a moment's act, can slay the god. Precarious is his immortality. He has a thousand ways to suffer and die. Yes. And then he's going to describe them. And we know that this is our experience, you know. You're very much in love. And uh, just the wrong word. <laughs> or... Um, Something that goes wrong, a moment's act, can slay, can kill that, that God of love. So his immortality is very precarious. It's not safe. It's always in danger. Because love as we know it has a thousand ways to suffer and to die. Joel. Love 
cannot live by heavenly food alone. Only on sap of earth can it survive. For thy passion was a sensual want refined, a hunger of the body and the heart. Thy want can tire and see or turn elsewhere. Yes. So he's admitting that there is something divine about love. But he says, love cannot live only on that divine food. Hmm? It can only survive, I suppose this is on earth, on sap of earth, that juice which flows through the, the earthly plants. Hmm? It needs that in order to live. And he says, in fact, your passion was a sensual want, refined. It's a longing of the senses. Admittedly, it might have been sublimated a bit, lifted up, purified a little bit. But that's what it is basically, a hunger of the body and the heart. And what can happen is that <coughs> soon that hunger of yours can get tired and cease and to <coughs> excuse me somewhere else you know, start longing for or loving something else Andres for love may need a dark and pitiless end by bitter treason or wrath with cruel wounds separate for thy Unsatisfied will to others depart when first love's joy lies tripped and slain. A dull indifference replaces fire, for an uncaring habit imitates love. Yes, thank you. We'll pause there because it's quite a long sentence. So it may be something that simply that you get tired and you, your affections turn elsewhere. Or love may meet a dire and pitiless end. It may be killed in a very cruel way by bitter treason if you feel betrayed, completely uh, betrayed by the person you love. Or wrath, anger can separate two people who are in love. Separate them with cruel wounds that may take a long time to heal. Or, um, after some time, when first love's joy has been stripped and slain, then um, the unsatisfied will will turn to other objects of love. It can happen like that. There are people who just love in a very selfish way. Or the other thing that happens is that there isn't a separation, there isn't bitter treason or anything like that. There's just, it dulls down to indifference. You just get along nicely. That replaces that burning fire, intense fire of love. Or it may be just an endearing habit maybe something, a nice companionship. It imitates love. It doesn't have that intensity that was experienced before. Sergei. Then how and how easy you can last all the ruthless of the lives that are lives. The ones they see of lives has been cut. The semblance Hmm. We can recognize this, no? The routine of a life's compromise. And where once the seed of oneness had been planted or cast into something that seems like 
a fruitful spiritual soil by a divine adventure of heavenly powers. Perhaps something from above had come or seemed to come, but after some time, these two, these partners, are just having a tug of war, struggling, competing. They are constantly together, but there's not much joy in being together. They are two egos, straining in one leash. You have a, a leash for dogs, no? And you have two dogs on one leash, and each one wants to go their own way. Two minds divided by their jarring thoughts. We believe that people who are in love, there should be harmony between their thoughts. But it's not always like that. The thoughts are jarring. It's actually what happens when a door is not properly closed. And it bangs. And it bangs again. It bangs. It bangs. <laughs> very, very irritating sound. So we say the door is ajar, it's not closed, it's not open, it's just doing this repetitious bang. So if thoughts are like that, that they irritate each other. Two spirits disjoint, forever separate. Even if they have to live very close together, they are living in separate worlds. Gumsun. Thus is the idea crucified in man's world. Trivial or so, this illusion comes. Life's harsh reality spares ever so. Heaven's hour. Adjourned. Mm. Yes. So the ideal of love gets falsified in the human world. Mm. This is how it happens. So trivial, unimportant, or dark, in one way or another, disillusion comes. The harsh realities of life stare at the soul and its ideals. Heaven's hour, the hour of the heavenly fulfillment, gets postponed, adjourned, pushed till later. Off it flies into bodiless time. Um, Mila. Then says the Trandis and says Satyran. He now is safe, delivered from himself. He travels to silence and felicity. Yes. So, because Satyavans died, you're, you're saved from this fate, hmm? this disillusionment. And Satyavan gets saved too. He is safe. He's been freed from his human self. He's traveling with me, with death, to silence, to felicity, to bliss. Hmm? Yes, please. He is delivered from himself. Set free from himself. Hmm. From the body. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. How he not back to the free choice of earth and the poor happy life of any one man? Continue. In my vast practical spaces, life can see in harmony with the mighty harsh of death, where love lies slumbering on the grass of peace. Yes. So don't call him back to earth, to the treacheries, the betrayals, the disappointments of earth, and this poor, petty life of man who is still an animal. He's been delivered from all that. Don't call him back to you. Let him sleep in peace in my vast, tranquil spaces, in harmony with this mighty hush 
this silence of death, where love, this disturbing, troubling element, love, lies sleeping on the breast of peace. We'll just read one more sentence. Would you read? <clears throat> and now go back alone to thy spirit word, chastise thy heart with knowledge, and put to see. Thy nature raised into pure living height. The heavenly birds, heavenly birds view from unimagined peaks. Yes. So he says, now you have to go back. Hmm? Back alone to thy frail world, to this world fragile, breakable earth. And you will have to chastise, you will have to discipline your heart with knowledge. And you must take off your blindfold. You must unhood, open your eyes, see how things really are. See your nature rise, raised up into clear living heights of higher knowledge, no? The, bird, the view that the bird has from heaven, from his unimagined peaks. Forget all about Satyavan. You can have a higher existence. Discipline your heart with knowledge. Go for a higher vision. See thy nature raised into clear living heights, the heaven birds view from unimagined peaks, from high, high up, see how things look from there. <coughs> we will stop there today. Some very beautiful lines coming. We won't rush them. Anybody has anything to ask? Uh, yes, Sandra. Well, in this case, that is only speaking about uh, human love, not like divine love. Yes. Yes. <coughs> What he's doing is trying to counter the influence of the ideal. You know, there's these beautiful dreams, this really wonderful realm that they have entered after passing out of the eternal night. Um, but he wants to tell her, don't follow anything like that. These things cannot be grasped. They are not real. They are fleeting dreams. And you're what you now you are trying to do something superhuman. You're trying to rescue Satyavan from death. Um, you won't be able to do that. It's not possible. And this love that you are claiming as your justification, your guiding star. Forget about it. It's not like that at all. He's trying to disillusion her. So shall we go back to uh, bottom of page 609? We can read these lines together. The avatars have lived and died in vain. Vain was the sage's thought, the prophet's voice. In vain is seen the shining upward way. Earth lies unchanged beneath the circling sun. She loves her fall, and no omnipotence 
Her mortal imperfections can erase, Force on man's crooked ignorance, Heaven's straight line, Or colonize a world of death with gods. O traveller in the chariot of the sun, High priestess in thy holy fancy shrine, Who with a magic ritual in earth's house Worshipest ideal and eternal love. What is this love thy thought has deified? This sacred legend and immortal myth. It is a conscious yearning of thy flesh. It is a glorious burning of thy nerves. A rose of dream splendor petaling thy mind. A great red rapture and torture of thy heart. A sudden transfiguration of thy days, it passes and the world is as before. A ravishing edge of sweetness and of pain, a thrill in its yearning makes it seem divine, a golden bridge across the roar of the years, a cord tying thee to eternity. And yet how brief and frail, how soon is spent this treasure Wasted by the gods on man, This happy closeness as of soul to soul, This honey of the body's companionship, This heightened joy, This ecstasy in the veins, This strange illumination of the scent, If Satyavan had lived, love would have died. But Satyavan is dead, and love shall live a little while in thy sad breast, until his face and body fade on memory's wall, where other bodies other faces come. When love breaks suddenly into the life, at first man steps into a world of the sun. In his passion he feels his heavenly element. But only a fine Sunlit patch of earth The marvellous aspect took Of heaven's outburst. The snake is there And the worm in the heart of the rose. A word, a moment's act Can slay the god. Precarious is his immortality. He has a thousand ways to suffer and die. Love cannot live by heavenly food alone. Only on sap of earth can it survive. For thy passion was a sensual want refined, a hunger of the body and the heart, 
Thy want can tire and cease, or turn elsewhere. Or love may meet a dire and pitiless end by bitter treason, or wrath with cruel wounds separate, or thy unsatisfied will to others depart. When first love's joy lies stripped and slain. A dull indifference replaces fire, Or an endearing habit imitates love. An outward and uneasy union lasts, or the routine of a life's compromise. Where once the seed of oneness had been cast into a semblance of spiritual ground by a divine adventure of heavenly powers, to strive, constant associate, without joy, two egos straining in a single leash, two minds divided by their jarring thoughts, two spirits disjoined, forever separate. Thus is the ideal falsified in man's world. Trivial or sombre disillusion comes. Life's harsh reality stares at the soul. Heaven's hour adjourned flees into bodiless time. Death saves thee from this, and save Satyavan. He now is safe, delivered from himself. He travels to silence and felicity. Call him not back to the treacheries of earth and the poor Petty life of animal man. In my vast tranquil spaces let him sleep. In harmony with the mighty hush of death. Where love lies slumbering on the breast of Peace. And thou go back alone to thy frail world, chastise thy heart with knowledge, unhood to see thy nature raised into clear living heights, the heaven birds view from unimagined peaks.